So um, I decided, I, since we have a very short amount of time, I'm going to read from, uh, from Darren's Guitar Chronicles. I'm going to read, uh, read a scene that takes place here in New York, um, not far from here, actually. It takes place in the East Village. And any of you who are familiar with the way the East Village was, and this is about 1986, 1987, uh, will recognize this. So our hero is closeted gay musician trying to make it in the music industry. They've come to the city from Boston to play uh, a small club and then, you know, try to make connections with people in the music business and, you know, whatever. And he's just come from a kind of disappointing meeting, uh, you know, up on Sixth Avenue with a, with a record company executive. Um, and, and is, you know, kind of in a little bit of emotional turmoil like you are when you're 19. Um, and uh, he's decided he needs to go out cruising either for drugs or for sex. Um, and he chooses sex because that's a little easier. <laughs> you know, when you don't know, you don't have any connections, right? So, um, uh, so yeah, so I'm going to read a little cruising scene. He's also very inexperienced at this. So, yeah, I'll have to take these off to read. <clears throat> All right. I combed out my hair with my fingers, swept it to one side, turned up the collar of my denim jacket, and struck a pose in a store window. Not enough. <laughs> I took off the jacket, then my shirt, and put the jacket back on. I stuffed the shirt into my backpack, slung it over my shoulder, and checked my reflection again. It'd have to do. I wanted to fish out my sunglasses, but I needed to make eye contact for this to work. This wasn't the time to hide, and the afternoon was just beginning. I sailed through the streets, working my way east, hoping to stumble on a bar where making a connection would be easy and expected. I followed my dick like a divining rod until I realized I was right behind a brawny crew-cut type. He went into a bookstore on St. Mark's Place, and I went in after him. Mr. Crewcut went toward the back of the store. I pretended to browse along the way, feeling far too much like a lost puppy for my own taste. Another thing my dad used to say, when you're hungry, the first thing you swallow is pride. I stood next to him as he picked a book off the shelf and opened it. We were standing in the mystery section. I looked over the titles, absorbing none of them. He stood there, close enough that I imagined I could feel the warmth from his bare forearms. I waved my hand at the books and he looked up. I asked, what do you recommend? Hmm? He looked half at me, half at the shelf. I let my hair fall back and threw out my real opening line. I'm stuck in town till this evening with nothing to do. I raised an eyebrow at the books. What would you recommend? A woman brushed past us in the aisle and was gone. A half smile spread across his face as he began to comprehend my meaning. At least, I think he did, as his eyes also traveled the length of my chest where it showed between the open slit of my jacket. My heart was pounding hard as if he had touched me along that strip of exposed skin. I hoped my nervousness didn't show or that if it did, he found it sexy. I kept my eyes on the books now, but I could see the tapered outline of his forearm as he put the book back on the shelf. His hands were large and there was golden hair on the back of them. Mysteries are okay, he said, and took a step back. But I tend to stick with the ones I know, you know. I'm leery of trying something new, such as me. Well, you never know what you might find. I racked my brains for something to say, something that would make it irrefutable that this was a come on something that if he shrugged off, I would be sure was out of lack of interest, not misunderstanding. But I really couldn't say something like, by the way, I want to fuck your brains out. I looked him in the eye now, hoping it was the right time to do that. This time, the half smile came with a little setting of his jaw, and he shook his head in a quick no. I usually find I'm disappointed, so I stick with the old standbys. He gave me a little shrug as if to say, no offense. Good luck finding what you want, though. He waved as he walked away from me. I stood there staring at the books until my heart slowed to normal. Then I went and loitered outside the bookstore for a while, the midday sun heating me up until I took off my jacket. I slung it over my shoulder with the knapsack and tried to think of what to do next. Maybe I should give up and get back on the wagon, the trying to quit sex entirely wagon, which also does not work. <laughs> I looked up and Mr. Crewcut was standing there. He took a half step toward me. You might try number 111. I cocked my head and narrowed my eyes. Where? He jerked his head east, about two blocks that way. Thanks. I shoved one hand into the pocket of my jeans, and I stood there, giving him one last chance to change his mind. He repeated the little wave and walked on. I'll stop there. <laughs>
and tell us just a little bit about what Darren's guitar chronicles is and how long you've been doing it. Oh gosh, so I started writing this in the 80s when it, I was actually a teenager and you know, it's, it parallels my coming out story in a lot of ways, um, but I put it all into the words and experiences of a young gay guitar player trying to, you know, when I was trying to make it as a writer, he's trying to make it as a musician in a much, much tougher industry and one where, you know, public image is so different. Um, and then I put it in a drawer for years. When I started graduate school in, to get my MFA in writing in the early 90s, I brought it back out again and started it over. Um, and I, you know, wrote all through that two years of grad school. And then um, in the end, I had this sort of 300,000 word behemoth um, that then my previous agent sent around and, you know, got some nibbles and whatever. And then, then she told me, I'm not going to represent fiction anymore. I'm only going to represent how-to books. And then Lori came along and called me one day and she said, I have this how-to book that I need written and I thought you might be a good writer for it. Um, who's your agent? And I was like, by the way, nobody. And she's like, oh, so nobody's representing your fiction either. I was like, that's right. <laughs> and so then Lori sent it around to some various places and whatnot and we got some nibbles and in the end I put it back in a drawer because I was like, I couldn't, what, what every publisher wanted me to do was cut it down to 80,000 words, make it this one three-act novel, and, you know, and this is, this is the story of someone overcoming internalized homophobia, and that just doesn't happen in three acts like, like, a, like an ABC afternoon special, you know. So I decided to put it back in a drawer, and then in 2009, I started publishing it as an online serial um, where it's almost like his blog. You just get a short chapter twice a week, you know, it's in this voice, and he just tells you his story sort of going along, and now the 10th anniversary is coming up. I started in November 2009. It's 2019 now, so yeah, it's going to be, um, I'll do a little online party, and I don't know. Um, but yeah, at, at, at this point in the story where I'm writing now, he's 24, and it's 1992. So, and grunge has just happened. Um, you know, so yeah, a lot of things are suddenly changing in 1992. You know, Bill, Camp, Bill Clinton has just won the Democratic primary, and yeah, that's the moment that we're in it then. So yeah, that's, it's been fun. It's been fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, who's next?